Okay. Um, alrighty. Well, thank you everybody for coming to uh, another lecture of Hempology 101. Um, my name is Ted Smith, and uh, today's lecture is on uh, cannabis research and cannabis chemistry. And uh, I'm kind of trying today to, to sort of set up Dr. Paul Hornby, who won't be here next week, but will be here in two weeks. So I'm actually having to juggle the schedule a little bit to accommodate for him. He couldn't make it next week to do the, the chemistry le lesson. And I, I really appreciate his, his input enough that uh, next week will be cannabis activism. And I'm hoping for a guest speaker, but that hasn't been confirmed. But either way, uh, the, the uh, rotation is, is a little bit mixed up here. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to try to talk about research and, and chemistry and I say try because honestly I, I haven't had a lot of time to, to do some of my own research in the last couple of days. I'm, I'm really swamped with the, the Sensible BC campaign and, and other things. So today's lecture isn't as, uh, I guess, uh, current and, and uh, maybe not as uh, in-depth as some people might like, especially some of the online viewers who've probably watched a ton of videos. Um, but I, I hope today I'll be able to explain in sort of layman's terms uh, what uh, cannabis does, uh, what it's made of chemically and, and how it interacts with us because I've certainly studied it uh, a lot and talk about it a lot in my work and so uh, I'll, I'll do my best uh, to, to discuss the, the science of cannabis even though I'm, I'm not at all um, trained in that. And so to assist, uh, actually I've decided to bring a couple books today to quote from so that people don't think I'm just making this up. <laughs> In part because I'm going to start with telling you that cannabinoids, that is the, the active chemicals in cannabis, have been in existence in living creatures for 500 million years. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, to quote a book before I get into to what that means a little bit more. Um, again, just so you can uh, uh, appreciate that I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm not making all this up. This is, this is what science says. This is a book, uh, Marijuana and Medicine, Assessing the Scientific Base, um, out of the, the National Academy Press in the United States. So this is the Institute of Medicine. So this is a, uh, not a book written by, by some guy down the street. This, was, uh, you know, this is this, the status quo and what they accept. Cannabinoid receptors, and I'll explain a lot about receptors here. Cannabinoid receptors have been studied in most vertebrates, such as rats and mice. However, they are also found in invertebrates, such as leeches and molas. The evolutionary history of vertebrates and invertebrates diverged more than 500 million years ago. So cannabinoid receptors appear to have been conserved through existence at least this long. So it's at least 500 million years that we've had these cannabinoids around. But, you know, uh, it, it could be much longer. It's really hard to say. Um, this suggests that they serve an important and basic function in animal physiology. Um, in general, cannabinoid receptor molecules are similar among different species. So it's the same chemical, the same interaction that's been happening for, again, you know, 500 million years. And from what the, the scientists have discovered, the, the first cannabinoids appeared in uh, species um, of uh, um, sea life. Um, I'm trying to remember what the, the name of them. Sea, sea squirts? squirts. So uh, you can imagine uh, a sort of a plant living uh, on the ocean floor that was the first one to actually be able to feel around for its food and uh, be able to send messages from one part of the plant to the other. And that's what, what cannabinoids do. And so, uh, you know, send messages. So the first nervous systems, you know, again, before we had vertebrates or not, the first nerves that, that uh, evolved, you know, when, when we, there was no more life than what was in the oceans, pretty much, you know, started to use cannabinoids to communicate to each other and get messages. And these cannabinoids, like, you know, would have obviously started out as one, and, but they, they've evolved as well. There's now uh, about 70 cannabinoids that are very similar to each other, but they have very subtle differences. And we really don't understand a lot 
about those subtle differences. We've really looked a lot at THC and more recently some of the other cannabinoids, uh, CBD, CBN, CBG, CBC, um, some of these cannabinoids are getting isolated and, and studied. Um, but they all have the same basic mechanism at play. And I, I've come to learn to describe some of this in, in pretty simple ways for people. Nerves are like long strands of fiber that uh, don't actually touch each other. So we've got you know, nerves up, up and down our body. And the way they communicate is by sending chemicals through what's called the synapse, this little space between the nerves. And so I often use the analogy of hitting your knee playing rugby, because I played a lot of rugby. And uh, sometimes you'll, you'll you know, uh, hit, hit the ground hard, and uh, you just get back up and you just keep running. And uh, you're, you're, among other actions that are happening, um, your, your nerve uh, in your knee will be sending a, a message up to the nerve towards the brain, you know, there's a problem, you know, like we're freaking out down here. And so that's a chemical that gets sent to that second nerve. And that second nerve will send the same chemical to the third nerve and down the chain to your brain. Well, your body's um, means of, uh, I guess, getting the message to the first nerve that, you know, that they've understood, you know, the message got through, calm down, is through another chemical. Right? The second nerve releases this, this chemical into this liquid between the two nerves and it attaches to a receptor to tell the first nerve, calm down. Again, you know, we got the message. Well, uh, that is the chemical that uh, THC uh, matches perfectly, that calm down hormone as it is. And so that's why it's so effective for chronic pain or you know, if you hurt your knee. Um, and if you, you, you have uh, natural cannabinoids, that, that they're called endocannabinoids, and andamide is the one that's almost exactly like THC. And so your, your body releases these uh, anandamides uh, into the, the fluids, and that will latch into the, the receptor and tell that first nerve again, you know, the message has come through, you know, uh, calm down. That's why it's good for physical pain as well as mental anguish. It just calms the nerves down on a chemical level. Uh, whether there's a good reason for the nerve to be agitated or not, it's going to just calm that down. And the way that it attaches to the receptor um, is also uh, very interesting because you know, we have chemicals flowing through our bodily fluids all the time. And uh, the, re the receptors are designed to fit with very specific chemicals, like very specific. And the, the easiest way for a person to think of it is sort of like a, a baseball and a, and a glove. Um, if you get a brand new baseball glove, the, the first thing that you want to do is take the, the ball that you're going to use it with and uh, put it in there, wrap it up real tight, and you submerge it in water. Um, and then you bring it out and you dry it so that that ball fits perfectly inside that glove. And then when you use it, it just fits. Um, well, the, the fit for a receptor uh, and, and a cannabinoid is, is even more perfect than that. Um, if you do you know, anything to that cannabinoid molecule, it won't fit as well. It might come close, but it won't really fit <coughs> quite as well as it will if it's a perfect uh, you know, cannabinoid. Um, and there's two different kinds of receptors. And so, again, we, we really don't know which cannabinoids fit into which receptors best or, or why all that is. It's still you know, really early on. Um, but the, the fact is, for 500 million years, you know, uh, virtually you know, most of, of the life that's evolved on this planet to, to have any kind of intelligence or nervous system at all have used cannabinoids internally uh, in order to maintain you know, uh, different forms of, of balance. And so what, what we, we saw, or what we've seen you know, in the last 500 million years is we've, we've sort of evolved from these uh, sea squirts, and essentially so is the cannabis plant. 
you know, and, and a lot of other life from, you know, these very basic early forms of life. You know, er, er, you know, we've all evolved from, from sea sludge in some sense towards this. And so um, it's uh, something where, you know, again, 500 million years ago, some uh, forms of life turned into plants and started to spread on the ground. And, and they used cannabinoids, uh, obviously, for their own immune systems and, and uh, communication in different ways. You know, it's hard to know all the way that TH, their cannabinoids are used by the plant. They actually haven't studied that much at all. So uh, we're really guessing a lot when we suggest why, you know, THC is even formed on the plant, you know. But it seems to be primarily for the plant's immune system and uh, just general well-being, you know, in some sense, not much different than us. Um, it, yeah, it fights off bugs as well. Um, the trichomes are kind of sharp, so they're meant, uh, there's actually a lot of non-cannabinoid trichomes on a plant leaf, and they're really kind of sharp, almost like barbed wire that the plant puts on its surface that bugs don't like crawling on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the cannabis plant, for, for its own reasons, evolved, you know, using cannabinoids, but there are very, very few other plants that have got uh, similar cannabinoids. So, you know, for whatever reason, um, it, it, it wasn't as successful to use cannabinoids for plants as it has been for vertebrate animals and, and again, even some non vertebrate animals. Um, but, uh, you know, it is the case where, you know, all animals have uh, what, what we call an endocannabinoid system. And an and, and anamide is, is only one of, uh, you know, many, many endocannabinoids. Um, that are now uh, being researched, uh, unfortunately, primarily to create drugs from. Um, that seems to be the main thrust of, of research into endocannabinoids, is to A, understand how they work, and then B, uh, create synthetic uh, compounds that are very similar to them that they can then market um, and you know we're seeing that already in a number of areas. There's a lot of appetite medications that are out now uh, using endocannabinoids to either suppress appetite or uh, encourage appetite. You know, the the uh, endocannabinoid system is meant to maintain homeostasis, so it brings the body, you know, back into balance. And so, um, you know, it's it's uh, something where some uh, endocannabinoids again work one direction and and some work the other. And so, uh, yeah, when, when it comes to, you know, how it works to maintain balance uh, in, in bodily functions, that's another uh, interesting uh, area of, of research. Um, they uh, have come to describe cannabis as, uh, or the chemicals of cannabis as maintaining homeostasis throughout the body, or, or, or balance, as I said. And th there's some examples to use. The, the most fun and, and so easiest to use is your temperature. I um, know a number have heard this already, but your temperature isn't exactly 98 degrees all the time. At some points, it's going down a little bit, um, at which point you either uh, put on some more clothes or turn up the heat um, or do something, or your body releases endocannabinoids to bring your temperature back up. Um, if your temperature goes too high, and you can't open the windows or take off some clothes, you come up with another endocannabinoid that tries to bring your temperature down. Um, the cannabinoids most common in the cannabis plant tend to bring your temperature down, um, which is healthier for you. Um, your internal organs and you know, your brain even function better and even will function longer if you're operating at a cooler temperature. Um, but it also means that potheads are cooler. <laughs> um, because our, our temperature is brought down uh, just slightly when we use uh, the, the herb. And so, uh, you know, there's uh, other ways uh, that the, uh, the plant, uh, I guess appetite is another uh, excellent example where for some people cannabis can be used to stimulate their appetite. You know, the munchies are quite famous uh, amongst, uh, you know, cannabis consumers. Uh, that being said, there's, there's other studies that, that come out about uh, the use of cannabis to maintain uh, proper weight and to uh, use it to help uh, people, um, you know, stop eating and, and smoke pot instead of 
uh, of eating munchies all the time. And apparently, you know, that uh, is a, a potentially useful strategy for some people as well. So, you know, it can go uh, both ways um, when it comes to uh, appetite stimulation. Uh, I think another good example is uh, blood pressure. Um, it can be a blood regulator, and, and that goes uh, both ways. It can help bring your uh, blood uh, pressure down or, or up, uh, depending upon the, the strains that you're using. Uh, each one of us is individual, too. I like to describe us as individual strains of, of humans. And so we, we have our own unique chemical makeup. And sort of these plants, you know, I've described cannabis, but, but cannabis is made up of a lot of different things. And uh, the, the 70 cannabinoids I mentioned um, don't appear in every plant. Um, each plant contains 6 to 12 of that group of 70 cannabinoids. And then they contain different essential oils. In fact, there's a whole lot in, in cannabis. I've got a list of stuff here, actually, of uh, different uh, chemical compounds. And so, uh, yeah, when this book came out here, we got uh, cannabis and cannabinoids, uh, Ethan Russo and uh, Franjo Guterman. Oh no, I lost my other page. Um, but yeah, here's a, a list of the different uh, constituents that, that uh, appear or can appear in a, in a cannabis plant. So there's, uh, as, as of this time, this is 10 years ago, there's 66 cannabinoids, 27 nitrogen compounds, 18 amino acids, 11 proteins and enzymes, 34 sugars and related compounds, 50 hydrocarbons, uh, 7 simple alcohols, 12 simple uh, alkydes, 13 simple ketones, ketones, ketones should have you up reading this, Dan. Uh, 21 simple acids, 22 fatty acids, 13 simple esters, 11 steroids, 120 terpenes. <coughs> Non-cannabinoid phenols? Yeah, it's close to 25. <laughs> 21 flavonoids. They're very similar uh, to the uh, terpenes. One vitamin, vitamin K, uh, two pigments and uh, nine other elements. So there's a, for a total of 483 chemicals that can appear in a plant, but they're not all the same. You know, uh, certainly not when it comes to the uh, cannabinoid profiles, which is why each strain has a slightly different effect on uh, people, because again, we're unique strains of, of individuals, and uh, while each one of these strains would have THC, CBD, and CBN. Um, you know, it's, it's unclear what the uh, content was um, or is uh, for, for the other chemicals. They're just not studied nearly as much. Um, sorry, I just lost my other page. Oops. Um, yeah, so I... I, I I should do those that too, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I kind of got myself thrown off there, but uh, I'll pick it back up by just giving some of the, the history of, of who's done some of these discoveries as well. Um, oh boy, I got a lot of time. <laughs> um, and so uh, the THC molecule was first isolated. Um, probably wrong here, was it 1967? Um, I think it was something like that by uh, <coughs> Dr. Raphael McCoolin, I think is, is how you say his name, uh, from the University of Israel. It's really interesting that a lot of the uh, discoveries of cannabis uh, continue to come out of Israel and uh, what this doctor in particular has, has been doing. And so uh, yeah, when, uh, when when THC was was first discovered, um, you know they obviously you know turned it into a synthetic drug as quickly as they possibly could, and so uh, it, it didn't take long for uh, Marinol to get onto the market and be sold. I think, although I think it was the 1980s before it actually got sold on the the markets, um, but uh, there have been a, a few other synthetic forms of uh, THC brought onto the market since then. <laughs> um, 
interestingly enough, uh, THC by itself uh, doesn't appear to have uh, as many benefits as using the, the you know, THC with, with other cannabinoids in the whole plant. And THC by itself uh, causes a, a number of side effects uh, that uh, don't either appear uh, with the whole plant use or, or don't appear as much. Um, anxiety appears to be a, a really bad problem with people that use Marinol or synthetic forms of THC. Um, there's another cannabinoid called CBD, um, which balances that uh, effect out. And so um, one of the problems we're seeing on the marketplace today is that uh, strains have been grown for very high amounts of THC and uh, CBD for the most part hasn't been uh, uh, considered uh, a factor and, and if anything uh, CBD has been almost grown out of different strains um, because growers have tried to create a very profound kind of euphoric effect and uh, you know that uh, uh, and some people can, can push them to anxiety <coughs> with the high THC content but uh, <coughs> You know, fortunately, uh, the value of uh, CBD uh, is being, uh, I guess, discovered now, and uh, more and more uh, effort is being made to have uh, high concentrations of, of CBD in the genetics as, as well. But uh, CBD has not been uh, synthetically uh, manufactured as a drug. Um, I guess uh, the, uh, the the only way that it can be legally purchased uh, is in uh, Sativix, which is a, a spray. Usually I bring it, uh, these things actually to show off a bit. But uh, yeah, Sativix uh, from JW Pharmaceuticals, uh, based in England, um, has uh, a spray. It's, it's really not much more than a tincture and a spray bottle. Um, but the difference is, is that they've, um, I guess, first extracted the THC and the CBD out of the plant and then um, put it into this mixture so that it's a perfect one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD um, that would never otherwise be possible in the plant itself. So the company claims that it's uh, you know, natural forms of THC and, and CBD, um, but the process by which they, they manufacture it isn't something that any of us would consider really that natural, it's certainly not homemade medicine. <coughs> And it uh, could be much, you know, uh, very easily e extracted from the plant. You just wouldn't have that perfect one-to-one -one ratio every single time. And so, uh, yeah, that that uh, actually, you know, really is is the crux of a lot of the the problems with with studying cannabis um, and cannabis uh, becoming uh, an approved drug. Um, the drug approval process, as it stands, has never had a plant go through it yet. Um, the drug approval process is designed for uh, specific chemical molecules uh, to be isolated and uh, made in a very consistent manner so that there are no variations from batch to batch. Um, in, in the eyes of the, the medical establishment, that kind of consistency uh, is, is critical in order to understand, you know, what the, the drug is doing uh, to, to the uh, average person, I guess, in their, their minds. Um, it's really uh, unfortunate that uh, that is the only form uh, of medicines that uh, Western uh, medical, uh, I guess, uh, professionals consider, um, and they consider the variability in, in plant medicines uh, not consistent enough to, to use, which is why they don't generally include you know naturopathic medicines uh, in you know Western medicine. Although they're starting to consider you know plant-based medicines more, um, they've certainly gone for decades uh, trying to you know prove that somehow these isolated chemicals are better than the, the plants from which they originally came. And in some cases, that that might be true. Um, but it's, it's hard to imagine coming up with a safer plant to use than cannabis. You know, most other plants you can't smoke, for example, without having a serious effect, negative effect from or, or eat, but you know, they may still contain good medicine. And so, uh, 
Yeah, so anyway, so as soon as uh, Dr. Raphael McCoolin uh, isolated THC, um, there's been a real drive, you know, to uh, use the synthetic form of THC among the medical establishment and a drive to find uh, uh, more information about this because um, the next step uh, after discovering THC was to discover, you know, why it was able to have such a profound effect uh, on the body. And uh, I guess it was 1988 that they first discovered the receptors that I mentioned, the cannabinoid receptors. And uh, it was in uh, 1990 that they discovered that these receptors uh, also exist in our brain. And uh, they've discovered, uh, in fact, that uh, our, our brains are just loaded with these. So I'm going to read a little bit more uh, from this book here um, uh, about these uh, receptors uh, in the brain um, before I talk more about what, what that means. So CB1 receptors are extraordinarily abundant in the brain. They are ab more abundant than most other G protein coupled receptors and 10 times more abundant than the op op opioid receptors. The, re the receptors responsible for the effects of morphine. Um, the cannabinoid receptor in the brain is a protein referred to as CB1, the peripheral receptor that is outside the nervous system. So there's some inside the nervous system and then there's receptors outside of the nervous system. Again, THC and cannabinoids interact with us in a lot of different ways. That what I described with the nerve and how it helped calm the nerve down, that's one potential use of THC in, in, in the body. And, and, and I'll get to, to more hopefully in, in a little bit here. Um, and so CB2, the most abundant on cells in the immune system, oh sorry, the peripheral receptor CB2 is the most abundant on the cells of the immune system and is not generally found in the brain. There are no other receptor subtypes that have been identified. Um, I think I lost my other page here. Oh. Yeah, so we've discovered um, that uh, these cannabinoids exist, uh, again, all throughout uh, our brain, these, these receptors. And um, they appear in, in pretty much every part of our brain uh, except for the parts that control our heart and our breathing, uh, which is why we can't die from overconsumption of cannabis because we don't have receptors in those parts of our brains so it, it doesn't interfere with our breathing or our heart rate. So um, there's uh, uh, some safety in the use of cannabis, whereas a lot of other drugs do uh, interact with those two parts of the brain, which is why you can have overdose deaths. So we're very fortunate that, that it doesn't uh, have, have any impact on those parts of the brain. But it certainly is the case that we have these receptors all throughout our um, cerebral cortex where we do our higher thinking, it's where we have our motor skills, where our memory exists. Um, you know, we have these receptors, um, you know, literally just loaded throughout our brain and throughout our immune system as well. And uh, yeah, it's uh, something where you know the the the, the research um, on how it affects the brain um, is is being done actually quite a bit right now. Uh, again, I wish I had time to kind of bring myself up, up to date on more of it. Um, but we, we do know that cannabis improves certain functions of the brain in different ways. Um, for example, what we've come to know of as, as uh, um, well, I guess technically it's called nonlinear thinking, what we call creative thinking, is actually enhanced um, in the use, uh, or with the use of, of THC. And uh, there's studies that prove this um, they, most of the studies are using word association, where they'll take uh, subjects and ask them to come up with words or phrases that are similar to words that they are given. And hands down, uh, people do better in those studies uh, when they've had some uh, pod in them. 
um, they're just more creative in the language that they're able to use to describe uh, various things. And so uh, the language studies are the, the easiest ones to, to make that proof, but it doesn't take long to talk with uh, artist, uh, musician, or, or other creative uh, thinkers to, to know that the use of cannabis helps them think out of the box and explore. Um, Carl Sagan, the world's most preeminent uh, scientist really, um, was a very avid pot smoker and would uh, claim quite openly that it was the pot smoking that helped him you know, get his head around different scientific problems that he was having uh, issues with. And so uh, Carl is uh, certainly uh, one of the, the thinkers that <coughs> would back this claim up that cannabis uh, you know, just helps the brain you know, become stimulated in, in ways that allow us to explore uh, new things. And so uh, it's only been in recent years that the endocannabinoid system uh, has been acknowledged for what it is um, to the point where in the next issue of our newspaper um, we have an article by Dr. David Allen in the United States uh, talking about the lack of information in U.S. Uh, colleges and universities on this matter, in particular um, medical universities. Um, I believe it's the case where there's not a single um, class on endocannabinoids being taught in any major medical school in the United States. Um, I think the stats are something like only 13% of the schools even have endocannabinoids uh, in, in the curriculum where it's even mentioned. Um, and so, uh, you know, while some people and some scientists are, are really on to this and, and really know the subject very well, um, for the most part students and, and doctors are, are left completely in the dark about this. Um, here in North America, we, we do have a, a champion, Dr. Robert Melamine, um, who works out of the University of Colorado. And uh, he's uh, done a, a lot of work if you're wanting to study, you know, more about these systems uh, and talks, uh, Dr. Rel Dr. Robert Melamed really uh, puts me to shame with, with his knowledge set and, and his ability to articulate uh, what cannabis is, is doing when it interacts with us. I mean, he's just an amazing man. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, uh, I, I s another interaction, I said like, you know, the, the THC interacts in the body in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, you know, a lot of studies now are about fighting cancer, for example, and how uh, THC will uh, attach itself to various cancer cells and, you know, basically destroy itself uh, by, you know, uh, eating up the cancer. And so, uh, um, the, uh, yeah, um, and that's uh, THC acid and THC. And so, um, yeah, there's, like I say, there's a lot going on with, with cannabis, and so um, when I say THC acid, that's because in the plant itself, I don't know if you remember, I read off a whole bunch of constituents. Well, a bunch of those were acids. Um, and so in the raw plant itself, we have THC acid. We don't actually have THC itself. You have to convert it through heat to become THC. And so that's one of the reasons why we smoke it as opposed to eating it. Although smoking does get it into our bloodstream faster than pretty much anything. The only other faster way of getting something in your bloodstream is through an injection. And uh, actually, Dr. Uh, uh, McCool in, in, in Israel is starting to do studies, or has been for years, on injecting THC into the brains of uh, severely injured um, car accident victims, people who've just been mangled in their, you know, in comas, essentially, or you know, just very, uh, um, in, a, in a very bad state. And so it seems as though the quicker that THC is injected into the brain, the faster people can recover. Um, one of the oh, feels so good injected to into the site of the trauma because it stops the um, inflammation from happening. Yeah, and that's what causes most of the permanent yeah. damage. Yeah, one of the uh, the the main mechanisms as well of, of cannabis is to uh, calm down inflammation, and it's sort of like. You know, the way I described it with the nerves, except it's with the immune system. Our immune systems are funky things, I won't pretend to understand it. Um, but when 
you have a problem, say that you know you, you hurt your knee playing rugby, right? Um, so uh, your body releases uh, an anamide, right, the painkiller, but your body also releases um, a number of other chemicals to the area to try and heal the injured knee. And uh, one of the, um, the 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 sort of the chemicals, or I don't know, I don't think it's a hormone, but one of one of the chemicals. Um, that's released um, causes inflammation, um, and uh, the introduction of THC uh, into that area um, slows down the uh, inflammation from uh, continuing to occur. And in, in a way, sort of similar to the, you know how I describe the nerves telling each other to calm down. And uh, when you, you know, introduce THC I into the bloodstream, it will, you know, bring the inflammation down. Well, I stay in the bloodstream. You can do it topically as well as, you know, uh, smoking and eating it. So, no matter how you get the, the THC into your systems, uh, it will help bring the inflammation down. Um, that is uh, critical when it comes to uh, many of the medical applications of, of cannabis, um, as I just said, for people with. Brain injuries, bringing down the uh, inflammation, is, is critical both immediately and, and in the long term. Um, a lot of the pain and problems come from swelling within the brain. A lot of epileptic seizures and seizure type disorders come from you know either trauma to the brain or swelling in parts of the brain. Glaucoma is like swelling in various parts of the eyeball. So if you can control the swelling there and the inflammation, then your your glaucoma isn't as bad. Um, hepatitis C, it's like the swelling of your liver where it starts to become really painful, so if you can keep that under control, it's, it's, it's better. Obviously arthritis, fibromyalgia, you know, a lot of other conditions, you know, you have inflammation in some areas that can, can cause pain, you know, injuries, all sorts of stuff. So one of the, 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 the best, you know, kind of uses of cannabis is to work with our immune system to control the uh, inflammation in various places. Um, one of the other things that THC does in particular, oh, Mark? Yeah, Ted, can you comment on the pharmaceuticals uh, sesamet and nabilone, which I understand uh, reproduced one of the cannabinoids, but um, are sometimes effective. Do you know about that stuff? Well, uh, I, I was mentioning them, them earlier oh, on. I apologize. Um, although uh, those are the Canadian brand names for them. I was referring to it more as Marinol. But yeah, sesamet and nabilone are the <coughs> Canadian forms of, of THC and uh, well while some patients feel they can work for, for certain conditions they, they also generally find the side effects are, are quite disturbing although it seems as though the people that are, are used to taking prescription drugs don't mind it so much but for people that are used to using cannabis uh, trying to switch over to Marinol is, is a step back it's not an improvement um, for people that have never used marijuana before Marinol can you know, work better than other drugs. Um, in, in some ways, the side effects of Marinol aren't nearly as nasty as a lot of other medications. They are and worse than cannabis, though. So. Um, so, uh, oh, question? I tried Nebulon and Tessamaco is prescribed it, and I prefer cannabis over them because, frankly, it makes you, like, all zombified, and you really can't get up the next morning because you feel like been hit by a semi-truck, mm -hmm. so I find the cannabis is a lot more I think that's a very common experience. I don't know about the drowsiness and stuff, but yeah, um, most most people aren't preferring it. That's for sure. um, yeah, so one of the other things that uh, THC can do is attack free radicals. Um, you may not all know what free radicals are, but uh, free radicals are these like really nasty, uh, just clumps of shit almost. <laughs> but uh, just these um, chemicals that that uh, appear throughout our body um, that we need to constantly find ways to get rid of, and we get free radicals for all sorts of different reasons. Um, some some good, some not so good. Uh, obviously. You know the pollution that's in the world today um, is is very bad for us, and a lot of 
the pollution is in the form of free radicals, whether it's in the air, in the water, or, or in our food. And so we're, we're constantly taking in free radicals uh, when you're living in a city or, or other areas with, with, with any kind of pollution. Um, and you also produce free radicals even if you're eating like totally healthy natural foods because free radicals are actually a byproduct of, of eating food. And it's uh, you know sort of you know like the, the the waste that's left over, and our body does its best to try and disperse most of the free radicals, um, but they occur and appear all throughout us um, because they they also occur you know uh, or or appear you know in our body when we're we're using up uh, different foods as well like not just in our stomach but our stomach helps break it down so that it, the the different foods, you know, can, can get out, um, and so it's out in our outer lying regions that the free radicals appear as well. Could you clarify what a free radical is? Um, Dan could probably do a better job than me. Free radical is when you take a chemical compound and break it down, if you have an extra electron kicking around, it's basically an unstable, highly reactive species. They occur naturally basically everywhere at all times. The, lo the fastest enzymes in your body are actually designed to eliminate them. Um, so they're not a problem for most general life as we know it. We've Basically evolution took care of that probably prior to making the cannabis plant. So the, the whole free radical, you know, because we couldn't exist if we couldn't get rid of free radicals. Yeah, so it's basically highly charged species that we need to get rid of because so, they all react with things we don't want them to react with. And so our body does a really good job of getting rid of Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, that was better than my description. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I say, they're like these really, you know, just kind of nasty chemicals that float, uh, you know, all over us. And uh, they uh, love to gather together and turn into cancer. It's not the only way cancer can form. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if free radicals are allowed to basically, you know, persist in one area of the body for very long, they'll just kind of group together and, and, and eventually, you know, uh, form, form cancer. That's uh, one of the, you know, known precursors to it. And uh, THC just takes it on. So when it, you know, runs into a free radical in the bodily fluids, it pretty much just destroys itself while destroying the free radical. So you just end up with a bunch of you know, uh, smaller, uh, benign chemicals that the body can flush out a lot easier. Um, free radical by itself, the body can't flush out. It's got to do something in order to get it out of the body. And, uh, you know, we produce endocannabinoids. So we're constantly producing anandamide. And one of its main roles, aside from being a painkiller when we need it, is to help flush the free radicals out of our system. And so um, be, that's why sometimes people can consume really large amounts of cannabis, but they don't get high at all because the cannabinoids are actually being pretty much dissolved, fighting uh, in, inside the body, fighting cancers, fighting free radicals, <coughs> fighting inflammation. You know, um, if, 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 you know when, when Gail was going through her cancer surgery and, and her problems there, she was eating uh, about three and a half grams of cannabis a day and uh, for the most part it wasn't affecting her mentally at all. Um, it, 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 she, it, she was just in so much pain at the time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's also really good for that. Um, so I started to describe decarboxylating earlier and I, I kind of got lost. Um, so yeah, so the raw plant itself has THC acid. Um, in order to make it into THC, it's got to be converted by heat, which can be done in a, in a few different ways. Um, vaporizing uh, works just enough to be able to convert it uh, over to THC and uh, basically not quite burn it, but just you know vaporize it uh, off of the, the plant. Because on the surface of the plant, uh, most of the THC appears in the trichomes, like these little oil glands kind of on the surface of the plant. So vaporizing is an attempt to bring it up to a temperature that will convert it over to THC and then release it into the air so that you can inhale it. Um, so vaporizing is, is one way, obviously smoking it uh, is another. 
if you're going to ingest it orally or topically you need to convert it in the oven the best way is three hundred degrees for half an hour in a sealed container because you don't want to burn off the essential oils if they have oxygen they will burn themselves off so that the less oxygen you have in the container the better because the essential oils are really critical when it comes to a lot of the pain issues as well focused a lot on the cannabinoids but the, the uh, terpenes and, and flavonoids um, are also really important. Yeah, um, and I'll actually get to that in just a sec here. Time is going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we, we need to convert uh, the THC acid o over uh, in order to make it as effective as it is. Now, THC acid itself does have some properties. Uh, I'm pretty sure it fights free radicals and uh, you know kills cancer cells and stuff like that but maybe not quite as good as THC. And the other thing is THC acid does not bind to the receptors because it's got like this basically one extra, is it a hydrogen molecule? Or hydrogen okay. molecule. That's the whole oh, point of decarboxylating. Okay, decarb okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that makes it an oxygen, right? No, it's, uh, it's carbon and two oxygens. Carbon. I hope you would have corrected me if I've made too many mistakes here. Oh yeah. Okay. No, I like you. I like you being here because you'll you'll point me out if I'm wrong. Um, um, and so, uh, yeah. So it won't bind because it's like it's got like this extra thing kicking out, so it won't get into the receptor very well. But it will have a lot of other interactions with the body. But it's certainly best to convert it uh, by heat uh, if you're going to consume it orally. That's for sure. And uh, I, when we had Dr. David Pate out here for our bakery trial a couple years ago, I, I learned a few things from him as well. Um, and I, I like sharing what he talked about in terms of what happens when you're burning a joint. Um, because uh, what, what's occurring is as the heater um, burns down the joint, um, it actually decarboxylates the THC acid that's in the joint uh, before it, it gets burnt and then the heater actually vaporizes the uh, THC off before the heater actually gets to the point where it burns the actual uh, plant material. And so uh, you know in a way decarboxylating and vaporizing is, is occurring in, in the joint and uh, one of the reasons why you want to have the joint burning at uh, a lower temperature is because you burn off less THC um, if you have it at a slightly less temperature so actually smaller joints are better than bigger cone joints um, because big cone joints get this great big heater on them and uh, it's at a, at a higher temperature than, than a smaller heater and so you actually um, burn off more and, and uh, uh, aren't able to do this decarboxylating, vaporizing as, as efficiently. Um, and uh, like I say, uh, you know, this whole field is still evolving. Many of us are still learning. And until recently, um, our work at the Cannabis Buyers Club, I, I haven't mentioned it on, on the video, but I, I founded a medical dispensary <coughs> here. Uh, we used to sell our, our cannabis uh, and cannabis products describing the indica as uh, sedative because it has more CBD, the chemical I mentioned earlier, and our indica as being more uplifting because it has less CBD and more THC. Other way around. Other way around. Oh, sure. Sativa. Sorry. Other way around. Sativa's head. Okay. Okay. Sativa's the headstone. You said Sorry. the same thing twice. I said the same. Oh. Yeah. You yeah. Did. Okay. So sativa would have more THC and less CBD, and that would be the uplifting headstone. And we used to say that the indica um, had more CBD and was more of a relaxant. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, CBD isn't really a sedative uh, chemical. Um, and now a lot of strains of cannabis are coming out that are very high in CBD, but they're not really that sedative. And we've had to rethink our uh, description of, you know, the, the plants and why they have these varying effects. And so now um, we've got a new pamphlet that we have 43 food and skin products at our club now. And uh, we've, we've 
come to describe our, our food products uh, differently. Now we, we rate them according to their THC content, because they all have varying amounts of THC. And then we uh, rate the amount of CBD content. Uh, but the sedative effects, um, we, we, we've learned to attribute them more to actually the, the terpene, the essential oils. Um, and the uplifting or sativa effects, again, we, we ha have begun to attribute those to the, the terpenes, so we, we describe them as sativa terpenes and, and, uh, and indica terpenes. Um, but it, it does appear as though you know, the terpenes have uh, a, a, as much to do with the medical impacts of cannabis use as the THC and the other cannabinoids. Um, and so, uh, um, again, you know, it's still kind of evolving. We know very little about the terpenes, honestly. Um, Yep. The new research thinks that terpenes are, is what's responsible for protecting us from getting lung cancer when we smoke cannabis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the terpenes you know, seem to have a much more uh, profound impact than, than one would think. Um, and uh, we've seen this at, at our store where a lot of our members identify the cannabis that's good for them by the smell. And as soon as they smell it, it's like, okay, that's good for me. They can, you know, very quickly, on a, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they know it's good, but they know it works for, for their conditions, even, yeah. you know, like it's been uh, really interesting to see, you know, that kind of connection with some people, which is why we have to have our jars open so people can smell them, because sometimes people can smell it and they just know those terpenes just aren't going to, to make them feel better. Um, have you heard of like the effects of indica and sativa being the opposite for someone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, and this is where we're, we're all different, right? And James is like that too. Mm -hmm. Soiree, he's like indica affects him where indica or uh, sativa affects me, and vice versa. I like that too. It's weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and and again, this comes back to us all being you know different, strains, <laughs> different uh, strains of, of humans and different strains of plants. It depends on the chemical balance. But I, I think I, I spilled most of, of my knowledge about uh, chemistry and stuff. Did you have more to, to, to add or correct me with there, Dan? Or? No, I, I was out starting at the beginning again and trying to pick my way through it again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't torture you too much. Um, but uh, again, I, I hope I helped set you guys up for when Dr. Hornby comes in two weeks. I can't wait. Because he's the one whose brain you should really pick on this matter. Uh, I'm, I'm more of an activist than a, a researcher. Um, but uh, it, it has been a, a fascinating journey learning about this plant and how it works. And uh, hopefully I'll know even more for next year's lecture. So thanks everybody for coming out. And next week, Cannabis Activism. We'll see you there. Yeah.